Good morning. Thank you, Jim. Right? Yeah. Sometimes I get, get some of them mixed up. They're, they're growing so fast. Just looking at them, I mean, she's the youngest one, right? Oh, you picked up an extra one. What are you laughing about? I mean, okay, here's the guy in his prayer who was thanking God for this wonderful weather. He says, the guy who wears shorts no matter what, right? Yeah. Uh. Let me think how I want to get started this morning. A few weeks ago, before Christmas, I uh, drove a Washington uh, Panther Reds. They're, they're one of the uh, dance teams to Dunlap, and it was going to be an all-day event. Uh, and I got to see Tango before with uh, Dunlap. Did yeah, awesome, by the way. And uh, I don't know why we were just going to Dunlap, which isn't that far. And I think the thing started at nine o'clock. And our group wanted to get there at 7.15, so we left Washington at 6.30 <laughs> for 9 o'clock. So I was there for a long time, but I always go in and I watch the events of the kids that I drive. And I just love our, our kids so much and really just give support uh, to them, uh, build relationships with them. But I didn't want to go in at... 7.15. So I was on the bus and I was reading the Bible and doing some things and I turned on the radio and this year I uh, was listening to WCIC. I listened to WCIC uh, mostly and uh, they were playing all Christmas music since Thanksgiving and they, they played some of the older songs like uh, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas and Frosty the Snowman and stuff like that but the majority of their music is Jesus Center, uh, Jesus Elevated. Uh, a lot of them were original songs that many of the different Christian artists have written. And I, I was walking up and down the aisle of the bus, okay, I do that. And I was listening to this music, and all of a sudden it just dawned on me that I just felt so good. I just felt so much at peace. Uh, the shalom that we talked about at Thanksgiving, uh, peace even in the midst of conflict. <clears throat> and I was trying to think, and I, you know, I was thinking, you know, I'm just, but I've been listening to that for weeks. And it dawned on me at that moment. It's because all the music that I've been listening to for about a month was Jesus-centered. Every song, other than the funny songs about Rudolph or whatever and what's called, but those are very few and far between, and I, I love those songs too, by the way. But every song was about Jesus coming, the Prince of Peace, mighty God. Every song was Jesus-focused and it dawned on me that that was the reason that I was feeling so much joy in my life and so much peace in my life. Because everything was about Him. My eyes were completely on Jesus. And I did not realize that until that moment that that is what God was doing through this music. None of the songs dealt with ourselves. None of the songs were dealing with me and my problems or different things that we struggle with. Every song was about Jesus. And I thought, man, what if that happened year round? What if every song dealt with Jesus and put our eyes on Jesus Christ instead of on ourselves? Amen? Last week we started out talking about uh, resolutions. Don't know how many of you have made resolutions, but we were mentioning that, you know, how come so often do we not continue those resolutions? Maybe some of us never even make any more resolutions because I've been doing it for like 20 years and I never am successful, so I just want to quit making them. 
But what is the reason that we do not succeed in so many of our resolutions? I just had a friend uh, yeah, yesterday uh, that I went to college with, 66 years old. I, uh, I was our uh, quarterback for a flag football team for our club. And I can remember him playing on our football team. He was not my go-to receiver. My go-to receiver is Bob Hilton. But I can remember, I think he was our tight end or something, and every once in a while I would throw the ball to him, and, and we called him Red Bud. That's because he was from Fort Knox, Arkansas, and Fort Knox, Arkansas, their mascot was a Red Bug. There were a lot of Red Bugs in Fort Knox. And he had a little bit of red hair, so that was his nickname, Red Bug, and he passed away yesterday from uh, kidney failure uh, because of diabetes. <coughs> makes you think about your life. makes you think about your health. And one of the things that I mentioned last week that we're, you know, we always tell, well, I'm going to eat healthier. Let me ask you a question, and, and I touched on this a little bit last week, but we're going to touch on it again just a little bit right now as we get into it. Let's Why do we, when we go in the store, why do we pick up that bag of potato chips and that dip? You know, as I mentioned last week, they don't jump out of the, on the ship, out of, off the shelf and into your cart. It's because I want it. Oh yeah, I know that I'm not supposed to buy that and I'm not going to buy it, but you know what? I want that. I want that one pound candy bar. Itself. How many times have you said, dealing with, with a lot of different issues in your life, how many times have you ever said, you know what, I am my own worst enemy? I am my own worst enemy. And that's true. The, the scripture that Jenna read from, from James really points that out. And, and in verse 14, what James says about temptation, I mean, how often do we blame God? I mean, I stop and think about the very first sin in the world with Adam and Eve. Right off the bat, who did Adam blame? Well, he blamed Eve. He didn't blame the serpent. He blamed Eve. But really, when he blamed Eve, who was he really blaming? He blamed God. Well, God, that woman that you gave me. So in a sentence, he was blaming God for his sin. And then when he came to Eve, who did Eve believe? Eve blamed Satan. So in the story in Genesis chapter 3, so, so God, in the story, right, God goes, well, you know what, Adam, you're right. Mm, that's okay. And, and Eve, yeah, you're right, it's the serpent, so, you know what, I'm going to curse the serpent. Well, you guys, you're all right, just go ahead, just go on, move on, you're fine. Did, is that how the story goes? No, that's not how the story goes, because it wasn't the serpent. It wasn't Satan that tempted them. And Adam shows that in his response. In his response to God, in his response, what he really says is, God, it was you. And then in, 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 in pointing to God, he was also pointing to Eve, his wife. He didn't blame the serpent. Because it wasn't the serpent. And that's what James is really telling us. He says in verse 14, temptation comes from where? From our own evil desires, which entice us and drag us away. It's so easy whenever we're tempted with something in our life, it's so easy for us to go, wow, you know what? I think it was Flip Wilson, wasn't it, for some of us old people? They used to always say, the devil made me do it. The devil does not make you do anything. The devil did not make Adam and Eve eat that piece of fruit. Adam and Eve ate that piece of fruit because they wanted to eat that piece of fruit. 
And the same thing with you and I in our life. When, you know, it was the passage that Terry was using uh, in, in, in Matthew there. When he talked about the, the greatest command is to love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. And the second is like it, to love others as we love ourselves. And it's easy, just like Terry was talking about, though, for us to go, okay, I'm going I'm to make a plan. I'm going to put things on the calendar. I'm going to make that a priority. But I am going to love God above everything else. Let me ask you this. How many of you this last week, did you love God above everything else? Every decision you made, every relationship that you had, every conversation that you had, whether on the phone with a stranger or face-to-face -face with a friend or, or somebody at work or even an enemy, how many of us thought, you know what? In everything I do, I am going to love God above everything else. And I'm going to treat everybody the way God would. How many of us did that? Why? Because of self. Because of self. And it says that our own desires, they entice us and they drag us away. <laughs> And then they give birth to sinful actions. They give birth to sinful actions. We wonder where where did that come from? <clears throat> I can remember having conversations with brothers in Christ and we're out on the golf course with one in particular, and, and I mean, he hit a bad shot, and I, you know, hey, that's the normal for me, so I'm, I'm used to it, but he wasn't that used to it. And I mean, all of a sudden, this profanity just comes all out of his mouth, and then he looked at me, and he goes, man, I don't know where that came from. Well, I do. Our actions start with self. There's something in self. And when sin, it says, is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. What starts out maybe is something that we think is so innocent and not a big deal. But you know what? Hey. Yeah, it's not going to be that big a deal. I want this. This is going to feel good. Uh, you know, this is going to make me happy. Whatever. He says it begins to birth actions in us. And those actions, if we allow them to grow, if we allow that stuff to happen, because we all fall sin, we all fall short of God's glory, right? The Bible tells us that. But when we allow that to continue in our lives, and I'm going to just think in that, it gives birth and it leads to death. And death is not like, you know, you're just dead and dead all over. It is, it is a separation. It is separation from God forever, for all eternity is what sin does. And it's all because we become our worst enemy. It's us. It's me. If you have your Bibles or if you have your phone and you're kind of following along, turn to Galatians, uh, Galatians, 1 Samuel chapter 17 in the Old Testament. We all have giants of some sort that we face. What could be a giant for me? may not be a giant for you. What's a giant for you may not be a giant for me, but we all face giants of some sort. Dottie, I was thinking about my mom. And my mom's Dottie. And it made me think about you. And something I haven't done with you enough. I thought about with my mom. My dad passed away six years ago, uh, Thanksgiving time. In those six years, I have never ever asked my mom how she's doing without my dad. Never. 
And the reason I thought about Dottie was because I was thinking about with her and, and some of your posts with, with the holiday season coming on, how, how difficult that is and, and what happens. Loneliness begins to set in. When you have your mate with you for those amount of years, and my parents was 60-something years, <coughs> loneliness begins to set in. That's a job. Because what happens when something like that begins to set in, then what happens? Well, then that giant goes and gets some other giants, right? And then all of a sudden, bitterness could set in. Maybe anger could set in. Depression or anxiety. So many other giants begin to come. So all of us in this room right here, every single one of us are facing giants of some sort. I know because I hang out at Washington High School some, and with a lot of students, I know school is, is, is not easy, is it? Always easy? Is it easy, Anna? No, because there are giants all over the place, right? I mean, you walk in, the, in those doors and all of a sudden, I mean, there's all these giants of, of wanting to be accepted, <clears throat> wanting to be, uh, you know, part of the crowd, part of the group. And, 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 you know, your persona, everything changes. It can change just like that. And every single one of us, regardless if we're young, if we're old, if we're at school, or at work, or are we retired, or whatever, there's some kind of giant that is out there. And, and when you look at David, David was facing a literal giant, and his name was Goliath. And here's David, he's 15 years old. Think about this, and think about this, those of you in school, 15 years old. I'm telling you, David was a God warrior. For our kids at school, you can be a God warrior. This is not a time to put your life on auto cruise. Fly under the radar. You can be a God warrior. But it all depends where your focus is. You see, David... He's taking care of his, his father's sheep, but he's got three brothers that are, that are soldiers, that are warriors in Israel's army. They are soldiers. The Philistines are, 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 are going to battle against the Israelites. <coughs> and as his war rages on, here's Goliath. He comes out, and he is the superior fighting machine of the Philistines. He is a giant, literally, over nine feet tall. And he would stand there and he would taunt the Israelite army for 40 days and 40 nights, twice a day, for 40 days, he taunted the Israelite army and he called them a bunch of cowards. And so David was supposed to be taking some food to his brothers. His dad said, you know what? Hey man, send them, I want to get together some stuff. Let's send them some food. Uh, give them some snacks from home, see how they're doing, and all that kind of stuff. So David goes, and, and when he goes, he sees and hears Goliath taunting the Israelite army. He's 15 years old. He is not a soldier. And in verse 26, David asks this question when he's hearing all this taunting. He goes, who is this pagan Philistine? Anyway, who is this pagan Philistine anyway? That he is allowed to defy the armies of who? Of Israel? Of King Saul? No. Who is he that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Living God. Our God is not dead. Your God is not dead. Amen? He's not dead. He's alive. And here's this 15-year-old boy having to tell King Saul and these other soldiers that, you know what, if you serve a living God, who is this guy? So word gets back to King Saul. Well, actually, David, he goes to King Saul. 
And in verse 32, he tells King Saul, he says, hey, don't worry about this Philistine. So where you got this 15-year-old boy that comes up to you and you're, maybe you got something going on when you're a policeman and all that kind of stuff. And this 15-year-old kid comes up, oh, Rick, don't worry about that. You know, I mean, you won't just thump him in the head, right? And here's what David says, don't worry about it. Hey, dude, I'll go fight him. I'll go fight him. And Saul replied, don't be ridiculous. There's no way that you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since his youth. In other words, hey, David, wake up and look in the mirror. You're just a kid. And it would have been very easy, right, church, for David to look at himself and realize, you know what? He's right. I'm just a kid. What was I thinking? Or maybe I wasn't thinking. I mean, I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. How many of you guys at school sometimes you feel like a nobody? You know, you just feel like, well, I'm just there. And you're trying to be invisible. You're trying to be like a fly on the wall or something. You know, nobody, nobody sees me down there, but I'm not really there. At work? In our community? Man, we're called to be light. In a dark world. I'm telling you, when things are dark and you see light, you know light is there, right? That's what he's called us to be. And so David told him in verse 37, The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. And so he picks up five stones and he picks up his slingshot. And armed with a shepherd's staff. And he starts out across the valley to fight this Philistine, this giant, his giant. And so here's Goliath. Goliath walks out with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in verse 42 with contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog? He roars at David. That you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his God. Have you ever been bullied? I don't think I've mentioned this guy in a long time, but I can remember when I first moved here uh, because the youth group always reminded me of Calvin Paxton. Let's see. Seventh grade. He was in the eighth grade. Every recess, Calvin Paxton wanted to whip me. For no reason. Just because he could. And I could remember he would get me down on the ground and he would be pounding the daylights out of me. And all I had to do was just see Calvin Paxton. And all of a sudden, I don't care how good I was feeling or how strong I was feeling or whatever, I began to think, you know what? You're nothing. David, you're a zero. You're exactly what he's saying about you. And what I want us to see, don't you know that David could have thought the same thing? When you're standing eye to eye with your enemy, with this giant, and this giant could be loneliness, it could be anxiety, it could be a, a, a toxic relationship that, man, I, I need to get out of this relationship. I need to break this relationship off, but I don't know how to get rid of it. I don't know what to do. When you're standing eye to eye <coughs> with whatever giant there is, it's so easy to look at self, but David didn't. David told Goliath, I come to you in verse 45. I come to you, how? In the name of of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you. This is the Lord's battle. The battle belongs to the Lord, the song that Dan led us on. It led us in. And he will give you to us. Here's what I want us to see in this. At 15 years old, where was David's focus? 
It was on God. So let's fast forward 30 years to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11 because David's facing another giant. But this time it's not a physical giant. It's not someone like Goliath. But he's facing a giant. David is 45 years old, 30 years later. And in verse 1 of chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, it was the spring of the year when kings normally go out to war. David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. <clears throat> That says a lot about David. Those first, that first verse. David should have been where? Should have been with his army. Should have been with his soldiers. Was he thinking about his soldiers when he made that decision not to go? I mean, you can read between the lines, can't you? David decided, you know what? I think I'm just going to stay home. I don't want to go. For whatever reason, he decided, I'm not going. David really should have gone. His men adored him. His men loved him. Matter of fact, when you look at the, keep your finger there, but the last uh, chapters and the last verse, last verses of chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, it, it talks about David's uh, uh, 30 mighty men. Well, I love that stuff. But there were three that were really, I mean, really super warriors for David. And, there, and the three in verse 13 of chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, the three who were among the 30, an elite group among David's fighting men, they went down to meet him. David was staying in the stronghold at the time, and the Philistine, here's the Philistines again, they had a detachment that had occupied, occupied the town of Bethlehem. They had taken Bethlehem. And here's David on the outside looking in, and this army had taken over their city. And David remarked longingly to his men, Oh, how I would love some of that good water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem. So what do the three do? They broke through the Philistine lines. They drew some water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem and brought it back to David, but he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out as an offering to the Lord. Why would he do that? He said, the Lord forbid that I should drink this water. This water is as precious as the blood of these men who risked their very lives to bring it to me. David just made a comment. I mean, he's out there and he's looking at the city of uh, his city and he was like, you know, man, what I would give to have some water from our wells in Bethlehem. Have you ever made a comment like that before? I mean, you're out, you're hot, you're sweaty, or whatever, and you're thinking, man, what I would give to have a good cold glass of, of lemonade right now. I mean, you don't expect anybody to run and go, I mean, if I were to say that, I don't expect Sherry to run in there and start squeezing lemons for me, you know? I mean, I, I'm just making a comment, yeah, man, that would be really good right now. I'd go bowl of ice cream or something. That's what David was doing. But his men loved him so much. They were so dedicated to him. And they wanted to please him so much that they actually heard him say that. And without saying a word, they broke through the Philistine lines. They went to that well. They drew him a bucket of water and brought it to him. They risked their lives for him. And now here's David when you look at chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. Here's David. He ought to be at war with these guys because they're willing to die for him. But yet he says, you know what? I'm just going to stay back home. He was thinking about himself. 
Is there anything wrong with him staying home? Not really. Matter of fact, he's king. He can do what he wants to do. But can you see where that was a bad choice? And as we read on, we're going to find out that it was really a disastrous choice. He was operating out of self. And so he was out walking on his roof one afternoon after his afternoon nap. Think about that. He's taking afternoon naps and his soldiers are out fighting for their very lives. And he looks out and he sees a woman taking a bath. And David says to himself, I want to have sex with her. I want to sleep with her. Thinking self again. This is what I want. I mean, here's his man again. Think about the whole scenario. See, God's word, he doesn't waste a bunch of words like I do a lot of times. You know, I'm up here talking or whatever and feeling. God, his words are never just filler. There's a reason he said that David stayed behind. If he had been where he was supposed to be. I can remember one time my dad had bought a new car. And we were having drama practice at night. Mount Ida, Arkansas. Love that place. And I got to drive the new car. I was supposed to drive to the school and then drive back from the school, back to the house. But oh, no, no. Carla Brasher. She didn't live on my route. She lived on a route that went around, kind of wide, and, and a little bit like a, I mean, hardly not the road went any wider than this aisle right here. We didn't have cell phones or anything like that, so, she didn't even know that I was driving by her house. But I just wanted to drive by her house. Came around the curve, and lo and behold, a tree had blown down three quarters across that road. I surveyed the situation, and I thought, oh, I can make it around that tree. No. I heard it scratch the side. Mm. I got out, I looked. You could see it, so I got home. Well, before I got home, I pulled over, I threw a bunch of dirt on it. <laughs> that didn't work. Next day, my dad asked me, where did that scratch come from? What, what scratch? What are you talking about? See, I, if I had done what I was supposed to have done, that never would have happened, but I was somewhere that I wasn't supposed to be. And how many times does that happen in a lot of our situations? How many times does that happen with a lot of our young people? How many times does that maybe happen in some of our lives, older people, when we were younger, and we knew, you know what, I shouldn't be sitting in the back seat of that car with the opposite sex. But I give in to self. Well, I want that person to like me. I want them to approve of me. I don't want uh, so-and-so to, 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 for them to start liking so-and-so. You know what? So, so we find ourselves in a place that we shouldn't be and bad things happen. It could be a party where we know there's a lot of alcohol or where there's a lot of pot or something like that going on. And yet we know, you know what? I really shouldn't be there, but I'm just going to go. And we find ourselves in a bad situation. Self. See how self destroys us? Man, we're our own, we're own worst enemy. So he goes and he sends someone to find out who this woman was. And the messenger comes back and she, he says, this messenger says, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, think about this. The king tells you, Hey, Mark, go find out who, 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 who this is. So the king tells you this. You come back and you go, whoa, dude, man, you got a good eye. She is hot. Man, you know how to pick your women. He could have 
understand all of that. I mean, I'm, you know, in thinking about himself, I'm trying to satisfy the king. I want to please the king. Man, you've got a great eye. But I want to tell you something. God was speaking through the messenger. What the messenger told David is, she has a name. She's just not a thing. She has a husband and a dad. She is married and she is someone's daughter. And her name is Bathsheba. That should have woken David up. When he realized, oh, she's married. Her husband is Uriah. She has a dad. She is someone's daughter. His name is Elio. <coughs> but you know what? David is so consumed with himself that he blows right past all of that. And he has sex with her. She gets pregnant. And then everything unravels. So David thought, you know what? I'll just uh, take care of this. Hey, you know what, Joab? Send uh, her husband Uriah, who's on the front battle lines. He, he's, he's, a, he's, he's a commander. Just, just send him on back. And, uh, and so Joab sends Uriah back. And, and David, David told Uriah in verse 8, he says, go home and relax. But Uriah, verse 9, he didn't go home. He slept that night at the palace entrance with the king's palace guard. And David wanted to know why. And Uriah said, you know what? The ark and the armies of Israel and Judah, they're living in tents. And Joab and my master's men, they're camping in the open fields. How can I go home to wine and dine and sleep with my wife? Put yourself in your eyes, shoes. I don't know how many weeks, maybe how many months he'd been away from home. If the king calls you in and said, hey dude, you can go home, you can sleep in your own bed. You can relate to that, right, Ryan, with Bible camp. Those little old cots that were two cents. Or are they sorry if anybody's watching this from camp? But they're not. I mean, you cannot wait to get home and to sleep in your own bed. That was he could have done that. He had not seen his wife. And here's the king telling him, go home, sleep with your wife. Do you think you're right wanted to do that? Do you think that maybe he wanted to eat some whole cooking? The answer to all of those questions is yes. I mean, you know he did. If he was thinking about himself, but Uriah was thinking not about himself. I mean, he was thinking what David should have been thinking from the beginning. Uriah did not think about himself. He thought about his men out at war. And Look at what Uriah did. Uriah could have gone, you know what? Man, I'd love to just see my wife. I'd love to just go to smell her perfume or whatever. Man, that could keep me going for the next six months out in the field at war. But here's, here's Uriah. He didn't even go home. He didn't even leave the palace. He slept at the palace gate. I would presume on the floor or on the ground. Because he knew that if I go to the house and if I start on the living room couch or if I start, start on the floor of the bedroom, it's not going to be long that I'm going to be wanting to satisfy my wants, my selfishness, and, and I'm not going to forget all about my men. Do you see how James comes to life in the words that James uh, wrote that Jenna read to us at the very beginning about how temptation starts? It starts with our own selfish desires. Self. Wow, we need to close. Next week, we're going to begin to look at, we're going to go to the master teacher. We're going to sit at the feet of Jesus next week. Because Jesus gives us a clear vision to overcoming self.
But what I want to give us this week as we walk out of here, we need some ammunition. I need some ammunition. So here's what I want you to concentrate on this week, okay? As you go out of here today, this week, keep this at the forefront of your thinking 24-7. And I know you're not going to do that because I don't do that. But I want to tell you right now, when you find yourself in a situation that you can act selfishly, I pray that these passages will come to your mind. And what we're saying now, that you'll think about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, there was this argument going on whether or not they could eat this new meat. Uh, you know, these, these were new Christians, and, and uh, there were there's was, there was groups of people that were sacrificing meat to, to false gods. So you had some Christians that thought, you know what, man, you're not supposed to eat that meat. Because you don't know where you, they would buy it at the marketplace, but but it could have been sacrificed to an idol first and to a false god first. And you go and you buy that meat at the marketplace, you don't know where it's been. So you know what? You may be sinning. You had other Christians that went, you know what? I never even thought about that. And I don't really think about that. I just went to the market to buy some meat because I wanted a hamburger or a piece of steak. And, and it's okay for me to do that because I'm not even thinking about where it came from because we don't know where it came from. What if it wasn't sacrificed to idols? And so really the argument was mute. It really didn't matter. But what Paul was saying to the group that believed that it was sin, he said, if that's what you believe, then don't eat it. But if you think it's okay to eat, you're right. It is okay to eat. So go ahead and eat it. But here's how they were to do it. So whether you eat or drink, verse 31 of chapter 10, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. This week, as you go about your day, you and I, we're going to be tempted over and over and over again to do things out of self. But God's Holy Spirit tells us no matter what it is you do, wherever you go, do it all for the glory of God. Is this glorifying God? Is it glorifying God for me to go to this movie? I hear Christians all the time that talk about, well, you know what, I can go to that movie, yeah, it's got sex in it, it's got nudity, it's got all kinds of profanity, oh, the L word is thrown around about a hundred times or whatever, but you know what, I, I, can, I can do that, I can handle that, it's okay. Well, I, you know what? They ask me, well, can I do that? I, you know what? I'm not going to answer that question for you. Number one, if you're asking that question, probably the answer is no. If you've got to ask the question, it probably means no. You really shouldn't be there because you're wanting somebody to just confirm that what you're doing is okay with God. And I ain't going to do that. What I'm going to ask you is, does it glorify God for you to be there? Does it glorify God for you to listen to that kind of music with those kind of lyrics? Does it glorify God for you to be at this place or that place doing this or whatever? Does it bring glory to God? Church, does it bring glory to God? Amen? And look what he says in verse 33. Why? Why do you do this? Paul said this, and I didn't see this until the other day when I was reading this in verse 33. Here's what Paul, Paul says, you know what, I too, I try to please everyone in everything I do. What? After what we were just saying, Paul says, you know what, I try to please everyone in everything I do. For selfishness? No. I don't just do what is best for me. I do what is best for others. Why? So that many may be saved. And you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Why do you make the decisions that you make? Go to the places you go. Do the things that you do. I want to bring glory to God. Because I'm not thinking about myself. I'm thinking about others. 
It has a whole meaning to be saved. How many of you want people to be saved? Am I doing it for God's glory? Or am I doing it for me? Will you take up the challenge? This week? I'm serious. Think about it in every encounter, every conversation, even when you're by yourself and you're thinking, wow, oh, there's nobody else around. I mean, that's what David was. There's nobody else around. Just walking around the group. Ooh, wow, look at this lady. I mean, he should have turned immediately. But he did. Does it glorify God? We're going to sing a song. When the roll is called a piano, right? Love that song. Good old hymn. And that's what it's all about. If I were to ask you, you know when I ask how many of you want to save someone? I mean, are we interested in saving people? I saw a few little hands go up. If I were to ask you this, let me ask you this. How many of you want to go to heaven? Ooh, look at the hands go up. When the roll is called a piano, I want to be there. Amen? Self leads to death. Being focused on God leads to victory and eternal life. Where's your focus?